as you probably have heard from your colleagues that have taken their remote pilot part 107 knowledge test, airspace makes up such a big part of it. Hey everyone, Jason Shepard here with RemotePilot101.com and I want to share with you guys some great airspace tips that I share all the time with our manned pilots in our online ground school as well as to our unmanned pilots inside our course RemotePilot101.com. First off, this chart that the FAA keeps showing, this one over here, bottom left hand corner, about how the test is broken up. Um, I'm going to call a fib on that one because they say operational questions make up 35 to 45 percent of the questions. And as you've been reading on the forms, I don't think anything can be further from the truth. It's all about airspace, sectional charts, METARs and TAFs, weather information is really the meat and potatoes of this test. So I think the FAA defines operations a little bit differently than you and I would. You and I might define operations as working a crosswind on landing and how do I compensate for that? Whereas the FAA looks at operations less about flying and more about, hey, you're gonna inspect this tower at these coordinates what kind of airspace are you in? And it quickly became an airspace question, which you look over here, they say makes up 15 to 25 percent of it. I can tell you it is significantly higher than that on the actual test. And that's why I wanted to take a moment to share some great airspace tips and overview with you all. And let's start from the big airspace and work our way on down. We're looking at a VFR sectional chart right now for the Orlando area. Orlando International Airport is right here. This is class B, class Bravo airspace. How do I know that? Because it's a solid blue line. You can see the multiple shelves here. You can see how the altitudes change. This altitude, by the way, is an MSL, height above mean sea level. So you would need to know the elevation out here to calculate, okay, what is 1,600 feet AGL for me, unless you have an MSL altimeter on whatever drone you're flying. This airspace goes from 1,600 up to 10,000. This shelf in here from 900 up to 10,000. This shelf out here, 3,000 to 10,000. You can see class B airspace is like an upside down wedding cake. It's multi-tiered and expands as it goes up. Look at these shelves here. Now you're saying, Jason, what does this mean to me? I can't go above 400 feet anyways. Yes, but look where this airspace goes down to. In this area, the surface to 10,000 feet. You absolutely must be talking to someone inside of class Bravo airspace. You have to obtain permission to operate. This is the nation's busiest airspace. Orlando, Tampa, O'Hare, Miami, Los Angeles, all examples of class Bravo airspace, the nation's busiest airspace, and it's shown by a solid blue line like you can see here. You must obtain permission to fly in its very much controlled airspace. Now we take a step down to a solid magenta line, which is class C, class Charlie airspace that you can see here. We have two of them. Class Charlie airspace usually just has one shelf. You can see the inner shelf here, and then we have, or the cylinder, and the outer shelf here that in this case goes from 2,700 to 5,000, 2,700 to 5,000. This is just a cylinder here from the surface to 5,500. You can see the shelf starts to break out this way. This is the Riverside, California type area. Chino's over here. This is Ontario International. Again, very busy airspace. Los Angeles International. You can see a little bit of their Class Bravo airspace sneaking in here. You must obtain permission, obviously, to fly in Class Charlie airspace solid magenta line. Their airspace, remember, is in height above mean sea level, 2,700 to 5,000. What's the elevation out here? I can look at Ontario to find out it's 944 feet above sea level to then do some subtraction to figure out what is this height above ground level AGL. I can learn that and I can see that there. Also on this slide, I can see class Delta airspace, a blue dashed line. Also controlled airspace that has a controlled tower. This blue dashed line, a little cut out there around that airport. That was awfully nice of them, wasn't it? Blue dashed line here, class Delta airspace. This airspace goes up to, but not including, 
2,700 feet. How do I know it's not including? Because of the minus symbol right here. Because the Charlie shelf starts at 2,700 feet. You can't have two bits of airspace both at 2,700 feet. So this airspace technically goes up to 2,699 because at 2,700 it becomes Class Charlie airspace. I still must obtain permission to fly in Class Delta airspace. Let's go and look somewhere a little bit more remote. Here's in the Cooperstown area. If you've taken your knowledge test just yet, the Cooperstown sectional chart like this is going to haunt you because it seems like every figure involves this sectional chart here. That's why I'm using this actual one for you. Now, notice there's not a lot of big airspace. We have this restricted airspace over here that we can talk about. We have a military operations area, these magenta hash marks that we can talk about. But what is this faded magenta circle here? I'm going to tell you something now that even my manned pilots struggle to understand. And it's where does Class Echo airspace start? Class Echo airspace is controlled airspace. Class Golf airspace is uncontrolled airspace. And both are shown in this picture. Let me explain. Cooperstown Airport, inside of this faded magenta circle, Class Echo airspace starts at 700 feet. Outside of it, it starts at 1,200 feet. Anywhere else, really, that's not depicted by Bravo, Charlie, Delta, or type of other airspace. This is called a Class Echo transition area, and everything else is called domestic en route out here. 700, 1,200, 700, 1,200, 700, 1,200. Doesn't matter where you look here. Why is this significant to you? Because class echo airspace is controlled. Class golf airspace is uncontrolled. I don't need to obtain any other permission, assuming I'm not in a national park or the city requires it, the county requires it, wherever I'm at. You gotta look at local laws as well. But from an air traffic control standpoint, I'm able to fly in class golf airspace without seeking prior permission. So in the case of Cooperstown, look back at the map with me now. Class Echo airspace starts at 700 feet. So I'm in uncontrolled class golf airspace from the surface up to 699 feet until I would be in class echo where I need to obtain permission. They say, Jace, I can't fly above 400 anyway. Yes, you're right. But what if you were hired to inspect this tower here or this tower and now I can be 400 feet above that obstacle and I could penetrate into that class echo airspace which again is controlled airspace. Outside of here in domestic en route, class echo airspace starts at 1,200 feet, meaning here on the ground, if I'm flying down this river, class golf airspace is at the surface up to 1,199 feet. Do you follow me with that? Airspace is so difficult to understand. And again, I'm just giving you a brief overview. We go into this in greater detail inside of our course, remotepilot101.com. And if you like my teaching style, if what I said today delivered value to you, I encourage you to check out our course. Because listen, this knowledge test is not going to be easy. You can't just go out and use free study guides the FAA puts out, which are good but you're reading through all of them and trying to understand it just by reading it rather than having someone explain it to you or having someone where you can pick up the phone and call or hop on a live chat or submit a support ticket like you can at remotepilot101.com. You can't just read the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge and expect to know everything and pass this with flying colors. So let us be your guide. Our course now includes 57 full 4K training videos. You're able to test on and see the actual FAA questions, and we're gonna help you submit your application. Taking the test is just half of it. Then you have to battle and navigate the FAA website called IACRA to figure out how to submit that and make sure your certificate gets sent off to you. So we'll help you with that process as well. And the course is your course for life. The FAA has said this is a test you need to take every two years. Well, guess what? In two years, we'll still be here. In two years, our course is going to be even better for you guys. It's $99 and the course is yours for life. I encourage you to go to remotepilot101.com to check it out, learn more, fall in love with our product, our teaching style, and tell your friends about it. If you're curious, there's plenty of reviews out there of the course on the forums, uh, on different websites for you guys to check out as well. So 
Listen, guys, uh, looking forward to seeing you uh, at a control site sometime soon and helping you uh, succeed in your small unmanned aircraft systems operations. We'll see you guys.